Good evening, everyone. We're just going to give folks a couple of minutes to get connected and then we'll get started shortly. Okay, it looks like we've got most people into our meeting here and it is seven o'clock so we'll go ahead and get started. So good evening everyone and welcome to the Northeast uh, Region Fisheries Management webinar. My name is Janine Higgins and I'll be the facilitator for this evening. So first off I'd like to thank everybody for joining us. Um, we've got a great big panel of folks here who are excited to discuss fisheries management with you in the northeastern region of the province. Um, we've also got a couple of folks here. My colleagues Heather and Jenna are going to be supporting some of the back end technical aspects of this evening and they won't have their video on for tonight. So you'll see them on the panel, but they won't necessarily be participating. So while we normally like to host these sessions in person, we are of course so thankful to have technology to be able to support us to still be able to gather during these unprecedented times. Tonight's meeting will be recorded and it will be posted on our um, in engagement webpage as well as our YouTube account. So if you can't stay for the whole night tonight, don't worry about it, you'll be able to view it uh, tomorrow. So to start off, I would like to respectfully acknowledge that I am joining tonight from Edmonton in Treaty 6 territory, and I would like to acknowledge the many First Nations and Métis whose footsteps have marked these lands for centuries. I honor and respect the elders of the past, the present, and the future. I ask that since we are gathering from across Alberta tonight, that each one of us takes a moment to personally acknowledge the Indigenous people of your region. So if you've been with us in our past webinars, this is the last webinar of our series for this evening. Um, we will have a very similar agenda to those in the past. So we'll be going through a welcome and some housekeeping items uh, before we move into the presentation on our proposed changes for the Northeast. After that, we'll be moving into our question and answer section of the evening in which we have our, our lovely panel here to be able to respond to questions before we close the meeting at 8.30 tonight. So in terms of how our question and answer will work, I see some folks who've been with us before have already found that button, but down at the bottom of your screen, you can see there is a Q&A button. And so that's where we'll be taking live questions for tonight. So I wanna thank everybody who pre-submitted questions in your Zoom registration. Um, we will be going through th three of those questions that were very commonly asked um, in, in those questions, and then we'll move into the live Q&A. So in terms of what goes into the Q&A, once you hit that bottom button on your screen, um, there will be a white box that opens up and that's where you can start to type your questions. So for this evening, we have lots of folks joining us on the call, which is really exciting to see so many people engaged in fisheries management. Um, but unfortunately, that also means that we won't be able to respond to all of your questions. So one of the ways that we will be sorting questions for this evening is through our upvoting function. And so um, if you see a question that you like or that you would like to hear the response to, you can go ahead and click that like or upvote button. And that will be one of the ways that we sort through the questions. So I will also be grouping some questions together um, if there's similar questions, just to make sure that we can get through a broad diversity of questions this evening and as many responses as we can. So a few other things for the Q&A tool. Um, anything that is typed in there can be seen by everybody. So uh, anything that's inappropriate um, will be deleted. Again, because we will be grouping questions that are similar, if we've already responded to that uh, question or the similar topic, we will be dismissing uh, duplicate questions as well. So again, I may be paraphrasing some of the questions that come in and, and grouping them so that we can give the best responses that we can have. 
So um, if we don't get to your question tonight, there's still lots of opportunity to engage with our experts. So again, we've got a, a large panel here tonight to respond to your questions, but if we um, need to defer it or if we can't respond tonight or don't have time to get to your question, you can still submit it through our Ask the Expert tool on our engagement page. So on that page, you can actually see other questions that people have submitted. And you can click through the tags that are there to sort out um, responses that you might be interested in hearing more about. So there's quite a few questions that have already been posted on there. So I would encourage you to um, have a look through all of the questions that are there before submitting yours. So with that, I'd like to introduce the panel. So our lead presenter for tonight is Dwayne Laddie. He's our senior fisheries biologist that we'll be hearing from shortly here. And then once we move into the Q&A, we've got a nice panel that will be joining him as well. So for our senior fisheries biologist tonight, we have Marcel, Rebecca, Miles, Dr. Steven Spencer. We also have Alicia, who's a fisheries biologist, Jordan, who is our fisheries manager for the Northeast, and Paul, who is the North East, North, sorry, Northeast Regional Director, um, Bill, who's our fish allocation and use specialist, Dave, who's our director of fish and wildlife, Craig, who's the fish culture manager, and we also have some folks here joining us from uh, Justice and Solicitor general. So we have Adam, who's an inspector, and Stephen, who's a superintendent. And then last but not least, we have Kate on. Kate on is going to be helping us in more of the technical aspects of this evening, so he likely will not have an active role on the panel for tonight. So with that, I would like to hand it off to Dwayne, who's going to uh, take over for the presentation here. And um, you should be all set to go there, Dwayne. All right. Thanks, Janine. And welcome everyone to the Northeast Fisheries Management Conversation. Thank you for spending your time with us this evening. I just want to start uh, with a quick overview uh, this evening of uh, the fisheries management system, uh, followed by uh, the meat of the discussion, which will be management notifications for Moose and Pinehurst Lakes, uh, followed by a quick summary, and then we'll be uh, opening up to a question and answer period. So uh, for those of you who um, joined our earlier conversations, uh, we, uh, there was a Fisheries 101 or a, an, introductory, an introduction to fisheries management webinar held on January 18th. So I'm going to go up uh, and do a quick review of that. So um, the uh, first step is uh, collecting information on fish populations. Step two, assess information and status. Step three, develop recommendations for regulations to meet our management objectives. And step four brings us to this evening, meeting with stakeholders to discuss results of latest management surveys and discuss and provide recommendations to you for options for harvest opportunity or where necessary notification of populations that are in need of uh, protection. And then step five will follow, which uh, in which we will uh, submit our uh, recommendations for uh, regulations. And uh, to hear last week's presentation on how changes to sport fishing regulations are made, please be, uh, please visit the uh, engagement landing uh, page at uh, www.alberta.ca. So begin step one, assessing fish populations be, uh, begins with good data. We use standardized methods of collecting information and um, that can include things like our index netting, electrofishing, angler surveys, and habitat surveys. The objective for standardization is to ensure that we can compare populations between water bodies and between years in the same way across Alberta and be speaking the same language to each other. It also means that we can compare the population health to establish thresholds. In step two, we establish populations using a science-based approach to determine the risks of the populations. These risks are scored to create our index of sustainability of the population. Think of this as a report card on, well, on how well our populations are doing. The scores range from zero to five with zero uh, or black indicating a population that is absent or only a few fish are uh, left in the population, but they're not able to recover themselves on their own. A score of one would be classified as a very high risk of collapse. We'll call that the red zone. 
a score of five would be classified as very low risk or in the green zone. These would be very low angling effort fishery, regular uninterrupted and successful uh, spawning cycles. The majority of our easily accessible walleye fisheries in the Northeast region fall in the moderate to high risk categories or the yellow or orange. The uh, Fish Sustainability Index allows us to uh, compare how our fish communities are doing over time in between locations, either the lake next door or the one in another part of the province. Generally speaking, for a rapid assessment, we find adult catch rates to be one of the best direct indicators of the health of a fish population. I'll be talking more about adult catch rates uh, for pike and walleye on a couple of our lakes in a few moments. Hey, Dwayne, it's just Janine here. I'm just going to turn your video off. Um, you're okay. just breaking up a little bit, so okay. that should help with our bandwidth issues. So I'll just turn your video off here. Thank Sorry you for to the... <laughs> no, no worries. Thanks, Janine. Hi, folks. So uh, continuing on with uh, step three, um, our management objectives and regulations. So we can usually meet our harvest or recovery needs through harvest regulations like minimum size limits, bag limits, or tags, or using conservation and recovery action through catch and release. So why did fisheries management investigate slots after many years of messaging about the risk of using them? Well, that's uh, an interesting question and uh, we'll, uh, We'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, so over the past decade, about 60 or 70% of our lakes are catch and keep, while the remainder are currently being recovered from over harvest using catch and release, or they're prevented from over harvest by using a tag. Um, the pattern seen on some of our lakes has been, uh, we'll have a recovered fish population, we'll open the fishery to uh, bag limits and size limits, Angling will be good for a little while, but ultimately it becomes overfish and then it's back into another recovery cycle. So the challenge is what regulations other than tags might prevent overfishing. And last year we had talked to you and we had heard that you wanted us to try using our harvest slot regulation. Slot sizes were introduced last year as a new strategy for the additional harvest opportunities for walleye and pike on lakes where we were previously managing through tags or catch and release regulations. And of the 38 uh, walleye slot limits introduced across the province last year, the majority of them are in the Northeast region. And 15 of the 19 provincial Northern pike slot limits are also in the Northeast region. Um, step four is going to be the focus of the talk this evening, where I'll be presenting data uh, that we've collected since uh, our last meeting uh, last year, where we introduced the harvest slots for walleye on uh, Moose and Pinehurst Lake. I'll start with Moose Lake. Where is Moose Lake located? So uh, there are a few Moose Lakes in northeastern Alberta. We'll be discussing the Moose Lake in the MD of Bonneville. <clears throat> Moose Lake is located to the west of the town of Bonneville and is within a three hour drive of the city of Edmonton. At approximately 4,000 hectares in size, it's a nutrient rich lake that experiences uh, blooms of blue green algae during late summer or early fall. It's a popular recreational lake, both in the summer and winter. Development on the lake shoreline is extensive and includes four campsites, a golf course and over a dozen subdivisions. The Walleye Special Harvest License or walleye tags was introduced on Moose Lake for the 2019-2020 sport fishing season. This was changed to a harvest slot limit of one walleye between 50 and 55 in the spring of 2020. In support of this regulation change, a commitment was made to monitor Moose Lake, uh, keep a close eye on it and evaluate the success in providing the, the, the additional harvest opportunity while not resulting in severely declining or collapsing fish populations. Um, fisheries management has since noticed a sharp decline in both uh, the abundances of walleye and northern pike since our last uh, public consultation a year ago. I'm going to review those findings with you now. So I'll be showing you a series of charts that represent the size distribution of a walleye population that's sustainably harvested and I'll quickly describe uh, to you how to read this chart. 
So uh, index netting catch rate is dependent on fish density or the number of fish in a lake. The more fish there are in the lake, the higher their catch rate should be. So catch rate is gonna be shown on the vertical axis and the taller the bar, the more fish. The fish population is divided into sizes of fish. Smaller fish are shown on the left and get bigger to the, the further to the right that you go. In this example, you can see that there are few smaller walleye and few larger walleye and uh, uh, compared to the medium sized walleye in the middle. And uh, also you can note that there's uh, not very many uh, walleye over 50 centimeters on this chart. And it's common to see that in a population uh, where uh, populations get uh, kind of cut off at that minimum size limit. And that's okay, as long as there's enough adult fish left in the population to, repl to replace them once they're harvested. So I'm going to keep that example population up um, in, in the background while I talk about uh, the, the uh, results from Moose Lake. Um, I just wanted to note that the, uh, this uh, distribution isn't theoretical. It's actually taken from uh, some of our uh, actual Alberta wildlife fisheries. So it's kind of a representative sample. Um, I'm going to keep the, uh, this distribution in the background for you. And I'm going to overlay Moose Lake. So let's take a look. Uh, this is from 2014. Uh, you can see the overall catch rates are similar to the example population. However, the adult catch rates uh, would be scored in the orange zone. Um, and you can uh, note that there's more, or there's a high, high number of uh, walleye in this uh, sample that are over 50 uh, centimeters. And that's more than what we would see in, in one of our normal, uh, uh, it's kind of like a, a, a one of our normal po uh, populations. So uh, moving on to 2017, we did another survey and overall Wallish uh, numbers showed a slight decline from 2014. And we see, uh, uh, we begin to see that there are a lot more walleye over 50 centimeters than below 50 centimeters, indicating that there aren't very many little fish in the population to uh, replace the larger older ones, which is a concern. At the time, the best option we had to try and prevent further decline while allowing a sustainable harvest of the bigger fish was by issuing walleye tags. After uh, listening to input from anglers last year, it was decided that Moose Lake could be considered as a candidate for a walleye uh, harvest slot for 2020. Um, the caveat being that if young uh, walleye don't start showing up in the population, we'll need to reconsider the slot harvest in the future. And this brings us to uh, the data that we collected last fall. Um, here you, can, you see that we found that the numbers of walleye are continuing to decline. Uh, there are very few small and medium sized fish that we saw and the population is supported mainly by larger older fish. All of our eggs seem to be in one basket as it were. There just aren't very many juvenile and small adults coming through. Moose Lake is becoming a, a retirement community for old walleye. So um, this is an adult catch rate comparison for walleye uh, from every index netting survey that we've conducted on Moose Lake since uh, 2000. The catch rate, again, a measure of the uh, number of fish or the density of fish is, uh, that we caught is on the, um, the, the left-hand side here. And on the bottom here is, are the individual uh, years. So this is the average catch rate in 2000 was, let's say it was about 12. 2005, it, it was uh, 17, and then it declined 15, 12, bebops up and down, but has continued to uh, decline. And we're now getting really close to the, the, the red zone. So when populations start to de or decline to this level, um, the fisheries management strategy for walleye uh, guides us to a fish management uh, uh, action of uh, recovery. Um, and that's going to be our recommendation going forward from tonight. So I want to talk uh, for a moment about uh, pike in uh, 
Moose Lake. So again, here is uh, an example of a sustainable pike uh, population length distribution, same as the walleye graph. Uh, and I've included a line at 63 centimeters for reference, uh, 63 centimeters being a, a common minimum size limit for Northern Pike. So here are re survey results from 2014. Uh, shows a similar size range to the example population, but uh, overall lower numbers. Catch rates from 2017 increased from 2014, but we're still about half the catch rate of the example population. And then in 2020, we saw another drop in the number of pike, about 40% of the catch rate that we saw during the 2014 survey. There's almost no evidence of recent spawning success since the, 27th, in, since the 2017 survey and very low spawning success since the 2014 survey. As with the walleye, there doesn't appear to be many immature pike to support the population in the long run. And here's a, a chart showing the uh, average catch, uh, adult catch rates uh, over the various surveys since 2000. You can see adult catch rates for pike have remained between the yellow and the red zone. And there's a big shift between the 2018 and 2020 results indicating a decline in the number of adults uh, seen in 2011 and earlier. So uh, we weren't able to successfully meet the objectives of providing a sustainable harvest opportunity for walleye and pike on Moose Lake. Uh, when populations decline and, beginning, and begin to raise uh, conservation concerns, the management strategy guides us to a fish management action of recovery. Plainly stated, it's our recommendation that we pause recreational harvest of walleye and pike on Moose Lake. Maintaining native pike and walleye populations in Moose Lake is not only important for long-term local recreational and economic benefit, but it's also important to the overall health of the aquatic ecosystem to maintain these top predators in Moose Lake. I'm going to move on now to uh, present results from Pinehurst Lake. Pinehurst Lake is approximately 240 kilometers uh, northeast of Edmonton and approximately 50 kilometers southeast of Lac La Biche. The lake is approximately 4,000 hectares in size a very popular recreational fishery and a very important indigenous fishery. Nearly the entire area surrounding the lake is protected by the Lakeland Recreation Area. And there's only one provincial campground with 126 camping stalls, a day use and a, and a, a boat launch. Piner's walleye were managed for harvest using a special harvest license or tag from uh, 2010 2010, pardon me, to through uh, 2019. The regulation was changed to a slot harvest of one walleye between 50 and 55 centimeters for the 2020 sport fishing season. And the current regulation for pike is catch and release. An index, setting, uh, an index netting survey completed in the fall of 2020 indicates that the abundance and maximum sizes of walleye have declined steadily over the past three surveys. We are seeing a trend in the population towards lower numbers of fish and fewer fish of large size. So again, our uh, example population is shown in the, in the uh, lighter color in the background, and I've overlaid the catches from 2014 for, uh, for you. 2014 catches show a wider size distribution of all uh, the Pinehurst fishery. Note the numbers of uh, walleye over 50 centimeters in this figure. A significant portion of the walleye relate, uh, re, sorry, <laughs> a significant portion of the, the uh, walleye population uh, seems to range between 50 and 70 centimeters. In uh, 2018, overall numbers of walleye dropped from the 2014 survey. However, they were small, medium, and large fish present, including the highly prized larger fish, as you can see out here. The 2020 walleye catch rates continued to decline from 2014 to 2018. Uh, with few large walleye collected in 2020, Pinehurst Lake is looking more like a uh, typical yellow or orange zone uh, walleye fishery, uh, meaning that it's man we're managing at higher risk and it's, uh, the, po the population looks like it's starting to uh, 
uh, get cut off uh, at the larger size. Uh, so we've been monitoring and managing the Pinehurst walleye in uh, the orange zone, as you can see, for many years. Um, we have managed harvest and provided a uh, popular and unique angling experience for the last 10 years on Pinehurst using uh, walleye tags. However, we heard last year that anglers are not satisfied with the number of walleye lakes that are being managed by tags. And we were asked to uh, investigate the use of a harvest slot as a means to manage some of these lakes. So uh, the purpose of tonight's presentation was to provide you with an overview of the results of our most recent surveys and to report on those fisheries where we have conservation concerns. In addition to the walleye population information I've presented on Pinehurst tonight, I'm able to share with you a preliminary analysis of angler effort uh, data that we collected this past summer. In uh, 2016, uh, we did a creel survey and we estimated anglers spent a total of about 30,500 hours fishing on Pinehurst Lake between opening day and the Labor Day weekend. Uh, during that same time period last summer, we estimated angling effort was about 38,000 hours. So that's an increase from 30,500. Two factors that could have influenced angler effort last year are access to more campsites at the uh, Pinehurst Lake campground and changing the regulation from a draw system to a slot harvest. While it's not surprising to see more anglers at Pinehurst the response to the regulation change, the increase in effort and the current population structure are a conservation concern. When populations decline and begin to raise conservation concerns, the fish management strategy again guides us to a fish management active action of recovery using a catch and release regulation. Um, I, I wanted to end this presentation on a positive note and highlight uh, to everyone that there are 22 walleye lakes in the northeast region that we took off tags and 12 northern pike fisheries that we're now managing using slot harvest regulations. Now, unfortunately, more up-to-date information show a couple of the orange zone fisheries that we had put forward for slot harvest last year took a turn for the worst, and we needed to reevaluate them. On behalf of the Northeast Fisheries Management Team, thank you very much for joining us this evening. And I'll now turn it back over to Janine, who will continue with the Q&A portion of uh, the, this evening's webinar. Awesome. Thank you, Duane. All right. So it's that time of the evening where I will invite the panel to turn your videos back on and join us as we move into our question and answer section. So I'll just give folks a moment here to rejoin us. And as previously mentioned too, we are going to be starting off with some pre-submitted questions um, that people had put in through their Zoom registration. So again, thank you to everybody who did that. Um, we had lots of questions that were submitted sort of along the same lines, and that's how we really chose our first three questions here. So the first one um, from our pre-submitted questions that we received quite a few um, questions about is just how does Alberta manage Indigenous uh, fisheries such as treaty status, First Nation, and Métis? Indian, I'd like to speak to that. So, yeah, you know, I, I really uh, I'd like to take advantage of the opportunities uh, that we get to describe to the angling community, the recreational fishing community, just how we go about managing uh, the indigenous uh, use of our fisheries. So it's, uh, it's great to have this opportunity again tonight. So our approach really starts off at the very high level with Canada's constitution, with the, um, the rights provided to Canada's indigenous people to harvest fish and wildlife uh, across the nation. And uh, by virtue of the Natural Resources Transfer Agreement, uh, Alberta's conferred the ability to manage the resources on behalf of the federal government. So to do that, we've got some very high level policy, uh, fish and wildlife policy for Alberta that outlines our priority for allocation of fish stocks. So the top priority is uh, conservation first. So that's simply the need uh, that we uh, need to address to ensure that the fish population is sustainable, that there is the inherent ability for that population to uh, sustain itself over time. So once those needs are taken care of, 
If we have fish available, we provide it next in order priority to indigenous use to fulfill those constitutionally enshrined rights. And then to recreational use, uh, one level below that. And if we have any kind of uh, use of fish that supports uh, economic um, opportunities, that is also an allocation priority, but it sits below recreational. So that gives us sort of a, an overarching allocation priority structure and how we go about actually uh, uh, providing for the, uh, the use of fish by indigenous uh, people is to uh, authorize it through a domestic fishing license. And this is something that's been in place for many years. Uh, traditionally, up until a couple of years ago, that license was issued and it only provided uh, the holder to uh, use a single gill net of a certain mesh size in roughly 240 water bodies across Alberta, most of which are lakes, and I think we've got maybe uh, eight or nine rivers. And um, that eligibility list was originally drawn up in it's been many years now uh, in consultation with Indigenous communities uh, inquiring and getting information about where they uh, conduct their fishing activities. So that became the list of eligible domestic fishing license waters in Alberta. So the change I implied in uh, 2018 was to allow for the use of rod and reel in addition to gill net by policy. So that's providing the ability for folks to make a choice um, where, where it, uh, I guess, benefits them, where it makes sense to either continue to fish with a gill net or alternatively to use a rod and reel. And it doesn't matter which um, method they choose to utilize at a, at, on that particular day, there are rules in place. So there's uh, general rules that apply to the use of rod and reel and gill net. Uh, such as uh, minimum size limits, uh, you know, default minimum size limits or min minimum mesh size restrictions, seasons, uh, closed areas in some cases. Um, and there's also water body specific rules um, that um, relate to more specifically to the, the conservation needs in a particular water body. So um, I think, you know, what that basically does is that um, it provides us more cleanly now with, especially when we're talking about rod and reel fishing activities, especially targeting fish uh, such as pike and walleye that are predatory and are very easy to catch with rod and reel. It allows us the ability to um, more, I guess, cleanly, um, I don't want to, yeah, I guess I'll use the word disentangle recreational fishing rules from indigenous fishing rules. And where that kind of you know, becomes um, meaningful is in a situation like what we're communicating about today, we're here to talk about changes to recreational fishing rules. That conversation may not trigger consultation with indigenous communities if it doesn't affect their use of the fishery. When we do wish to make, um, you know, propose changes, I guess, with regards to indigenous fishing rules, then we engage with those indigenous fishing communities. We sit down with them and we have a conversation about their understanding of the fishery and ours and uh, what we think you know, needs to happen to sustain their ability to utilize that fishery and fulfill their uh, indigenous rights. So hopefully not too long-winded. Hopefully you stayed with me for, for all of that. And I uh, really, again, appreciate the opportunity. So thanks. Thanks, Dave. So for our next question, um, we had actually quite a few again on, on this topic pre-submitted um, uh, from Grant and Mitch. And then I see there's a comment from Paul along these lines tonight as well, uh, wondering what can be done or is being done about the large number of cormorants on Moose Lake and how may they be contributing to the collapse of the perch population? Well, Jordan, I can see your mouth moving, but you're muted. I hope I don't do that all evening. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Grant. Mitch, you know, Ron, I appreciate those, uh, the questions, you know, and we've had this question come up quite a lot, uh, quite a bit in the last uh, couple of years. And so after the several, you know, years, we've had, you know, inquiries about cormorants, you know, and the potential effects on fisheries populations in the area, really focused around that Moose Lake, um, you know, a Muriel Lake, Frog Lake country. Uh, and so recently the department has reviewed some of the cormorant management programs across North America. 
uh, including some of the work in, in Ontario. And is evaluating options based on some of the, you know, considerations like uh, some logistical things, uh, social aspects, biological. And as a result, you know, Environment and Parks is planning to conduct surveys in the spring of 2021, so this upcoming spring, to help understand the, ex you know, the extent of the cormorant populations that we have in and around Bonneville, and also to planning to undertake some form of cormorant population management in the Moose Lake area. And that's this upcoming spring. You know, the staff, the fisheries management staff are really just working through what some of those, uh, what some of that would look like. And so, you know, we intend to, to provide more information and engage with stakeholders, you know, in, in the late winter, probably here. Um, and really the whole program is designed to understand and collect information to, to better understand sort of those potential impacts of the cormorants that might be and, and monitor some of the results. So I appreciate the questions uh, this evening about that. Thank you. Great, thanks, Jordan. I know that's also a question that's been responded to on our Ask the Expert as well, actually. All right, so for our last pre-submitted question of the evening, I have a question here from Ray saying, walleye numbers appear to be sufficient to allow some harvest in several lakes, including the North Saskatchewan River, Wabaman, Beaver, Logan, Touchwood, Kehewin, Floating Stone, Good Fish, Ironwood, Logan, Hart, uh, and a few others. <laughs> Could low-risk sustainable, sustainable harvesting options, such as one walleye daily with a slot size of 40 to 50 centimeters be implemented? I can take that question. So thanks, thanks for that question, Ray. Uh, it's really timely. Uh, we get a lot of questions on the details of slot limits and they're super common since we adopted these regulations across the province this year. Regardless of the type of regulation, the first thing that we need to do is determine whether walleye abundance can actually support harvest. And we do that by continually updating our data, typically through uh, index netting. So I'll give you two examples on the opposite ends of the spectrum. There's Wabaman Lake. Wabaman Lake was examined last fall uh, it demonstrated that there was a sustainable walleye population and as a result harvest regulations are being examined and public public information is being consulted on right now to determine uh, what direction we want to go uh, whereas we look at beaver lake which you also mentioned we need to update our data on beaver lake we need to get more current data so that we can make a decision on what regulation to use and uh, to inform what options are available to us as an example of a, a proven low risk sustainable harvest option, uh, the SHL is a good example or special harvest license or walleye tags. Conversely, data on harvest slot limits in Alberta is pretty limited. We've only done this for 11 months or so, so we only have that much data. We acknowledge that we don't have uh, a huge chunk of information on that. And to increase that knowledge, we're currently evaluating the use of harvest slot regulations on a number of lakes in Alberta. And these lakes are pretty variable. We have lakes that are at low risk for walleye and, and high risk. So we have a little bit of, of everything. Then hopefully we're gonna use this information to determine whether harvest slot limits are suitable as that low risk sustainable harvest option, as you suggested. Uh, additionally, this hopefully will provide data to determine factors that would increase the likelihood of success in the implementation of slots moving forward. Uh, I hope that helped answer your question and I hope everyone enjoys the session tonight. Thank you. Excellent, thanks Marcel. All right, so we're going to be moving into our live portion of the evening now. So just focusing on the questions that people have submitted this evening. So thanks to everybody who's been submitting questions so far. I see there's a whole bunch in here, which is really great. And people are uh, using the upvoting buttons as well. So that's one of the ways that we'll be determining which questions are next. Um, and just a reminder too to folks, because we do have so many people here, there are a lot of really great questions coming in. So just make sure that you continue to scroll through um, the, the Q&A box so that you can see all of the questions that have come in. So um, our first question here comes from Lauren saying, good evening. I'm wondering if there could be opportunities for municipalities and AEP to stock yellow perch on water bodies in the Northeast. They are a huge draw for tourism. Janine, I could take that one. Thanks, Lauren. I really appreciate this question too. I mean, it's top, it's timely. Um, you know, in terms of uh, some of the priorities for the department, you know, having an increasing um, opportunities for harvest is part of, you know, the things that we're trying to do. And so perch stocking is certainly one of the, the components that we're looking to, to do more of, uh, particularly in smaller water bodies that uh, may not contain fish already. 
one of the challenges we do have though in the Northeast anyway, especially is, you know, we're blessed with a lot of lakes, but, but the ones that we would maybe target for perch stocking, some of the smaller water bodies, some of them don't overwinter very well. What I mean by that is oxygen conditions can be kind of low in the winter. And so the first steps are really to identify those, some of those lakes and, and what, you know, whether or not they can actually support a population for a few years. So, you know, there, there's volunteers that are actually working to, to do some of that winter dissolved oxygen with us. Some of our partners with like the ACA is also uh, partnering to do some of that work. And certainly there, we could certainly talk, you know, as a municipality about some of that too. So I appreciate the question. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Jordan. Our next question comes from Ian saying, good evening team. Now that our cold lake fish hatchery is back online and got significant upgrades, can we see a proper restock effort for lake trout on Touchwood Lake? This is a historical lake trout fishery. If it could see an effort like Lac La Biche Lake saw on walleye in the last 15 years. All right, thanks Ian for the question. Uh, just, just the fish hatchery in Cold Lake uh, was uh, had a major upgrade in the, in the early 90s with ozone. Uh, Coal Lake, uh, Lake has got a fish disease called IPN, which is very common in the lake trout in Alberta. One of the, we did stock uh, Touchwood Lake in the late 80s, I think once or twice. So you're jogging uh, our memory, but some, somewhere back then, uh, before the hatchery was shut down with IPN, then we built the ozone plant. It, it, it purifies the water coming in the hatchery. One of the problems we have with lake trout, uh, trying to get a, a brood source of eggs for lake trout in Alberta, is pretty much every lake that we looked at in the early 90s uh, had uh, IPN. So the only lake that we found uh, IPN free is in Peerless Lake, uh, but we decided not to go there. It has a lot of conflicting interest uh, on Peerless Lake. So we got completely out of the lake trout program uh, after that. Now, in terms of the upgrades of the hatchery, um, the new announced upgrades of the, the fish hatchery, uh, the reuse uh, water, we're gonna actually, we bring in 300 liters per second of water into the hatchery and it, and it flows through the fish and goes back to Cold Lake. Now what we're gonna be doing is recapturing that water, that heat and bringing it back to the fish and reducing our, our utility costs. That part of the, the project won't be completed uh, probably 2023. So, uh, uh, but the, the hatchery will remain uh, uh, operating 100%. I can actually add a little bit onto that too, um, with regards to Touchwood Lake specifically. Um, I get this question quite a bit. <laughs> uh, so we extirpated lake trout from Touchwood Lake. Um, I believe the last one was caught in a commercial fishery in the late 80s, early 90s. Actually, might have been late 90s, early 2000s. Um, although, yeah, it is a deep cold lake, uh, very low productivity. Um, it does have some suitable habitat. Um, we would have to look at the lake ecosystem as a whole before we would go and throw back uh, lake trout in, into, the, into the fishery, just because it has implications outside of um, just adding lake trout. So then if you add another predator like lake trout, you're then affecting, um, you're competing with potentially the walleye that are in the lake. And if uh, that happens, then maybe your walleye's numbers reduce even more. Like it, it has far reaching implications rather than just adding fish to a lake. It actually changes the ecosystem. And before we would do that, we would probably want to do a lot more um, work ahead of time and, uh, you know, look at those kind of ecosystem implications. And of course, we'd have to look at it um, implications with regards to maybe impacts of indigenous harvest, um, stuff like that. So um, at this time, I think um, we wouldn't be looking to uh, do that just yet. Thanks. Great, thanks Alicia and Craig. So I have a couple questions from Ron here. I'm um, talking about the size of lake trout. Uh, 75 centimeters is too high. A slot size would be nice. So you can at least keep one fish to enjoy. And just wondering if slot sizes could be introduced for lake trout on Cold Lake. Um, catching and releasing 30 to 40 lake trout a day um, must take a toll on these fish. Hi, Janine. Yeah, I'd be happy to uh, answer the, that question on lake trout on Cold Lake. 
So um, thanks for the question, Ron. Um, uh, lake trout and cold lake are pr uh, pretty uh, challenging uh, species to regulate. Um, they're uh, slow growing fish and it takes uh, quite a while for them to grow uh, to, to size. Um, it takes, uh, you know, uh, 12 years to grow to uh, 65 centimeters, give or take. Um, and uh, um, it can take uh, many years to uh, reach uh, 75 centimeters. Um, one of the risks that we have to consider uh, uh, with a harvest slot for lake trout is related to that, uh, to that slow growth. So lake trout that would grow into a slot size would be vulnerable to harvest um, for several years um, and many more years than a comparable harvest slot on a faster growing fish like a like a walleye or a pike and uh, on cold lake um, with the increase in uh, the numbers of of uh, lake trout we've been seeing an increase in angling uh, effort um, and under the current angling effort where the concern is that there just may not be enough fish that would grow through a harvest slot uh, and over time we could be uh, looking at too few fish re uh, reaching those larger sizes and if we move the slot too too small uh, before those fish are able to mature, um, it's that the, there uh, there's a, a concern that uh, we could have an impact on uh, on spawning success. So, um, uh, slot sizes uh, would work uh, if effort is low enough. Um, so, one of the things that we'd really like to do um, would be uh, would, we're working towards collecting more recent angler information uh, to see if a harvest in a slot would be low enough that we could try that management strategy. Um, but we're also considering other harvest options. Uh, but thank you, Ron, for the question, and really appreciate hearing your your ideas. Um, there's uh, that's a, gr a great question, and 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 uh, um, there's uh, there's some opportunities, and we'd like to uh, to look at them. Uh, we also uh, the opportunities uh, need to be uh, well considered, and they need to be uh, they need to have a vision, and they need to have um, or it would be it would be. Uh, better if um, it was a regulation that we were able to uh, uh, kind of set uh, and 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 let run for um, uh, a long time rather than doing uh, very short uh, short period changes so moving slots around um, and another consideration um, is that Cold Lake is uh, managed uh, kind of co-managed with Saskatchewan because it's an interprovincial water body so any regulation changes that we propose on uh, the Alberta side would need uh, we'd need to consult with Saskatchewan and Saskatchewan has a different consultation process a different cycle and these kinds of things are are complicated and time consuming and are really hard to uh it, it could be hard to uh get uh, um a good uh mashing um uh so it's really uh there, there'd be concerns about um a, a, a short-term solution um i think we should be looking uh further down the road again thank you for the question great thanks Dwayne. We have another question just about Touchwood Lake here um, from Danny, wondering, are we opening up Touchwood Lake this year? And if not, why not? Oh, Alicia, I can see your, your lips are moving, but you're muted. There we go. Uh, anyways, <laughs> as I was saying, um, thanks for the question, Danny. Um, so Touchwood Lake, um, I see there's a bunch of questions actually coming up later on. Um, about Touchwood Lake as well. So I'm gonna try and maybe see if I can hit a few of them <laughs> just to hopefully get everybody's question answered. Uh, so Touchwood Lake is obviously a super popular fishery in the Northeast region. Um, I've spent a significant part of my childhood at that lake as well. I've fished it ever since I was a little kid. Um, so it's been on a catch release for a significant amount of time. So since about 1998. So just to go back a, a smidge, uh, previous to that, we had trialed a slot back on Touch Lake back in the day. Um, and uh, unfortunately, that one didn't turn out so well. Um, it knocked down the population quite a bit. So we uh, threw a catch release regulation on it in 1998. And uh, 
because Tuchwa Lake is such a really deep, cold lake, like it's it doesn't it doesn't have high productivity. Like the fish don't grow very fast, um, and there's also issues with uh, recruitment, um, spawning. Um, so it hasn't seen a lot of recovery, to be honest. So when we surveyed it in 2004, um, as Dwayne was speaking earlier in the presentation, you know that red, yellow zone that red, orange, yellow zone. So it's just above the red when we surveyed in 2004. Um, so, you know, densities were pretty low. Uh, so in 2009, we started to see a little bit of an increase, slowly a little bit more in 2014, it was looking really promising. And when you're know, starting to see a nice little upward climb. Uh, so when we went back and tested it in 2019, I had my fingers crossed. I thought, you know, it was looking good. Unfortunately, uh, that progress did not continue. So it turns out we lost a significant uh, number of fish from the population. Uh, I think it was around 30, 40% of the fish um, uh, disappeared from the population. So unfortunately, because of that, we, we are unable to open it. It's actually right on the cusp between a, that red and orange zone. Um, so it is definitely not uh, ready to be opened yet. So people will probably ask like, why? Um, it's been like this for how many years, what's going on? Um, so, you know, obviously there's going to be a lot of catch and release mortality because it's a popular lake, people love to fish it. Um, there's, it's also a pretty uh, significant indigenous um, uh, lake, you know, it provides a lot of food for our, our regional um, indigenous folks. So it's popular to them as well. Um, you can see from the data that there is some gate gaps in the age class distribution, meaning that there's likely not good consistent yearly uh, recruitment or spawning, um, spawning issues. Because that lake's so deep, it's so cold, um, it spawns late, later than most lakes do. It's about two weeks later than, than most lakes in the area. So it likely that's causing some issues with recruitment. Um, you know, also spawning habitat too might be limiting. I know they're, uh, they've been spawning on shoals there recently, which you know, um, maybe not as uh, good as, as spawning in, in the residential in the streams. So recruitment's an issue. Uh, mortality's probably a little bit on the high side with the combination of uh, legal harvest, hooking mortality, indigenous harvest, and then of course that those biological things that we can't control, like uh, you know the low productivity of a lake, um, issues with spawning habitat, late springs, um, and all that. So. Yeah, it's it's just not where we want it to be. Um, how do we fix that? Um, it's difficult when you're looking at things that are out of our control. We can only control mortality. We can't control uh, spawning success and stuff like that. Um, we can't control the fact that the lake is deep and cold and, and it just is what it is. Um, so hopefully, um, you know, in the next few years, we start to see a little bit of recovery again and then we can maybe reassess at that time. Thanks. Great, thanks, Alicia. Okay, so our next question comes from Lauren. Uh, I'm wondering why and how COVID-19 impacted fish stocking this year. I have heard through the last six sessions, but I'm unsure how and why it was impacted. Could it not have happened with social distancing? All right, uh, great question, uh, the fish hatcheries. So we, uh, with COVID, uh, the hatcheries are actually listed as essential services. So uh, our staff are at work every day and I haven't missed a beat. And so of course we practice, uh, uh, so, you know, social distancing at work and all the procedures, masks and everything. But in terms of uh, uh, fish stocking was 100%. Uh, we met all the targets that the, the, the area biologists wanted us to meet for all the lakes in Alberta. The only uh, program that really got impacted in 2000 was the uh, walleye, uh, 2020 was a walleye program. Uh, we were gonna do a, a spawn take uh, at a lake, uh, but we canceled that because of COVID. And the other program that we were gonna do was uh, we were gonna go back to Job Lake and do a cutthroat trout uh, egg take on Job Lake uh, to just solidify uh, our brood population that we're, we're uh, raising at the Allison Creek hatchery, um, but we canceled that. And so in 2000, in, uh, you know, this year in the fall will be our first uh, cutthroat trout that we can offer the biologists for, for stocking. Uh, most of the lakes are going to be on the west side of the province. Great. Thanks, Craig. So 
Our next question here comes from Greg. Uh, would you ever consider opening Long Lake near Boyle for more than SHL tags, especially since the Finn scores have been so high recently? Hi, Greg. Thanks for uh, submitting that question. The um, We did see a nice uptick from the 2017 survey in 2020. We had uh, um, someone contact us to to say that they thought things were doing well there, and in, in fact they were, and uh, and so the um, you'll see an uptick in the number of um, uh, tags allocated for the lake, and we saw an uptick in the number of pikes. So uh, good news at Long Lake. Uh, there was a short opening tried at Long Lake um, a few years ago that didn't do very well. It uh, over uh, uh, too many fish came out uh, very quickly with the uh, short opening. And the SHL seems to be working uh, quite well. Like we've gone from um, kind of borderline to um, to uh, to better population now. So we'll use that SHL tool to allocate more uh, tags. Uh, Lake tends to get a lot of use between the cottage owners and the uh, the park. Thanks for the question. Great, thanks, Stephen. So see, we have another question here from Kim. Um, are there any plans to reduce the large cormorant population on Northern Lakes of Alberta? I can take that, Janine. Thanks, Kim. Uh, appreciate the follow-up on this one. You know, at this point in time, we're focused mostly in understanding the, you know, the cormorants around the Moose Lake area. That will probably be our focus for the next a little while. That said, we are uh, do, going to do some reconnaissance, uh, you know, and I try to try and understand a little bit better what some of the populations are like around the, around the region. And certainly if people have um, some information for us around that, we'd be glad to hear about that too. Thank you. Thanks, Jordan. We have a question here from Ben wondering why is aeration not being considered for Little Bear or Hassey Lake? Hi, I'll take that question. Um, hi, you. Ben. Yeah, um, Little Bear Lake. Uh, it's um, uh, yeah, stocked fishery, um, and uh, aeration um, is a, a good way to carry uh, these uh, some of these fisheries through uh, through winters where there uh, there's um, uh, demonstrated annual uh winter kills and so the the you know if you're gonna put fish in them there's gonna be little to no chance that they're gonna survive through the winter and so aeration is a great tool uh on on some of these smaller fisheries to uh uh to allow these fish to survive on uh, little bear lake um it's a larger fishery uh or a larger uh water body and it has um uh quite successfully uh, overwintered um, year to year um, with the occasional uh, winter kill. Now, unfortunately, recently we had um, a, uh, a beaver dam uh, washed out uh, due to high water levels. And actually the, the water levels in Little Bear Lake have uh, dropped quite a bit. Um, and there is some concern, I, I, I understand, around uh, overwintering success. Um, aeration is something that has been brought up in the past. Um, I, I understand that there may be some technical hurdles. Um, not sure if uh, the technology would be effective on a, on a lake uh, this, uh, that size, but it is certainly something that we have talked about before. And um, we're certainly uh, would be interested in uh, uh, understanding more, learning more so it, it is an option but uh, I, I, I don't have a good answer for whether we can will or when uh, we would start to aerate Little Bear Lake. Thank you. Thanks Dwayne. Our next question comes from Doug. Many lakes in this region went to slot size harvest. If test netting shows a decline in populations in this slot size should this lake not go to a tag system with sustainable harvest allowed in whichever sizes? Once populations recover enough, then we could go back to a slot size and anglers could always have enjoyable fishing with either a slot size or a tag system in many lakes. Hi, Janine, I can take that one. Thanks for the question, Doug, appreciate this. Uh, you know, with slot limits, uh, we've 
as you said, implemented quite a few of them across uh, Alberta. A, a large proportion of them would be in the Northeast here where a lot of the lakes are. And, you know, I think one, it's just one of the tools in the toolbox that we have uh, to manage with. You know, Albertans asked us last year in the engagement sessions to try if we could try something else. And so we're giving that a try. And it'll likely take a few years for us to fully understand, you know, how well it's working. You know, are there particular places it works better than others? But, you know, slots are using special harvest licenses is another way as well that we could, you know, we can manage. And I think as we assess the fisheries and, 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 and understand what their statuses are, well, it's certainly one of the options we can uh, discuss with the public, you know, if we think that a regulation change is necessary. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks, Jordan. If I could, I'd, I'd just like to add on to that, uh, Janine. And, um, so I think this is a great question, uh, and, and I think it does link back to uh, right at the outset of the presentation that Dwayne gave, uh, that discussion around the fish management cycle, uh, and thinking about like uh, some of our documents we have out, uh, you know, the walleye recreational management framework, which uh, came out in 2018, um, that highlights some of those pathways where we have these regulations, as Jordan just said, we have different tools in the toolbox, uh, and, and we tie them to different objectives, so that uh, desire to offer sustainable harvest, that desire to uh, potentially look at a different objective, if that's a uh, quality fishery or something else, and, and understanding how those tools function, and that uh, something like special harvest licenses can be used as a recovery tool, uh, you know, uh, to provide a small amount of harvest while again, we're growing fisheries. Uh, but I think it's, uh, you know, very important to, to look at, um, look at regs and, and understand that there's no kind of silver bullet. Like uh, we do want them to perform in a certain way and, and under certain circumstances, we certainly see them work. Uh, but that's where the importance of that monitoring is, is really um, necessary to understand what's happening lake by lake, uh, get a sense of the time that we might need for those actions to take effect. As Jordan was kind of saying, there can be a lag there. Uh, and, and once they're on the land base, obviously uh, Alicia pointed this out as well with uh, things that, that happen in Touchwood, uh, the fish themselves can can introduce different pieces where we can have some inconsistent recruitment and, uh, you know, lakes may have variable water level years. So, um, you know, utilizing those regs and, and trying not to be uh, overly reactive with very frequent changes, but letting them play out uh, and then following those those cycles that we have uh, is how we try to be responsive and using that that uh, cycle that that Dwayne had in the presentation at the outset there uh, again coming back to to you as stakeholders to get that information is is really critical so uh, great question and and thank you for sort of highlighting those those points in that cycle I'd like to throw in my two cents too. <laughs> sure, go for it Alicia <laughs> um, uh, we've used the SHL to um, recover or try to recover some fisheries. Pinehurst was actually managed that way um, early on when it's uh, when we first put the tag on. So we put the tag on and we reduced the amount of numbers of tags that we gave out and we only gave class Bs. So basically it was a limited entry slot. Um, it did have some success, but it was, you have to remember it's a much slower recovery um, so it would take a lot longer for recovery to occur if it did. Um, I think with the way the population looks now, it might be just a little bit on the low side for us to try that. Um, I think just some uh, short-term pain for some long-term gain might be in order here. So if we can put it on catch release and for a couple of years, uh, give it a nice little kickstart and, uh, you know, we would have that recovery a little bit faster. So yeah, we've used SHLs for recovery, but it is a much slower process. Thanks. Great, thank you all for your response on that question. Our next question comes from Ben and he's just wondering why regulations and stocking change allocation decisions are made by biologists rather than a committee that includes elected officials and that would consult biologists and other individuals at the province. Uh, Janine, I'd like to speak to that. Um, so Ben, you know, that's, uh, that's a really interesting question. I don't know if we've had that question asked during our sessions yet. And, you know, I'm going to uh, try to give you an answer that uh, doesn't come across as uh, being overly bureaucratic and, you know, um, kind of legislative in nature. But um, I guess what I do want to point out at the outset is, regardless of who on paper is authorized or empowered to make the decisions, the whole 
point. And this is reflected in exercises and undertakings like we're in right now. The process of making decisions is collaborative. It's collaborative between the biologists who gather the information that you know, frame it within science to enhance the understanding, frame the question, provide options, information about trade-offs, engage with stakeholders, and make decisions together that, um, that achieve the things we want to see in our fisheries, the desired outcomes and the fishing experiences that we value. So, you know, there are some, some sideboards on that, you know, in this whole, you know, nice world of science and collaboration and, and engagement. I spoke earlier about the conservation mandate with respect to uh, the priority, you know, overarching even our allocation of fish to indigenous rights. We are accountable as, as public servants uh, in right of the crown to fulfill that mandate. And legislatively, there's authority given to the director of fisheries to uh, basically implement those changes. Now that said, we always do this in service of our minister who entrusts us to do the job that is assigned to us and to perform our duties in, in a way that he finds agreeable. So, you know, again, he's very much in support of our approach. He's very much in support of this kind of collaboration and interaction. We submit and we provide to him our advice and our information to help him come to a decision as to whether or not he supports and endorses the recommendations we're putting forward. And if he does, you know, it's very easy for those changes to be made, for those decisions to be uh, to be made. So I hope that um, I hope that provides you with the answer you're looking for there. I know that uh, you know things are a little bit different, especially south of the border, where there are things called commissions set up within some of the um, American states that have more of a legislated or policy role, I guess, in making decisions. And you know, because of our overarching legislation, uh, our relationship with the Crown, things are a little bit different in Canada. But that said, that's just legislation and policy. Where it really matters is the practice, the practice of bringing science information into a collaborative decision-making process that involves our stakeholders and you know, results in us coming to good decisions. So hopefully that uh, helps you out. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. If I can, I'd, I'd like to add on to that, Dave, too, because uh, so obviously last year uh, we had a number of in-person sessions that we did across the province. And, and uh, you know, again, speaking personally, I had the chance to attend ones in uh, Grand Prairie and Slave Lake and St. Albert and Lac La Biche and Calgary and, and a few others. Uh, I found it really uh, interesting and uh, and sort of reaffirming as well to to talk to dozens and dozens of people that that were were supportive of um, biologists being there uh, providing options you know we were asking in some cases like what what size of slot limit would you like to see uh, potentially implemented and we heard the answer many times of oh I'm, I'm more interested to hear from you what's the assessment of these different options where people didn't necessarily feel uh, informed enough to to put something forward that could potentially be um, you know uh, non-functional but were recognized and valued the role of, of biologists to have that information there, be able to describe trade-offs between options. Uh, and as Dave said, it, it empowered those people to then be in a place to contribute meaningfully to this collaborative process, uh, ensure their voice was heard. And, uh, you know, we've seen that in past uh, consultations of all sorts that we know that we have a, a broad spectrum of stakeholders out there that come from different levels of engagement and different levels of knowledge and uh, different even, you know, time frames, longevities, being a fisherman or being in a certain area. Uh, so it's great to gain that perspective across a broad spectrum. And, uh, you know, for me as a biologist, it, it was... Um, very cool to hear sort of firsthand uh, how other folks can see our role and support our role. And, and I think uh, as much as they, they wish to see their voice in it, they're eager to hear from us. And, and these sessions, I think, have been a great way for us to connect with people, uh, COVID aside, um, to present that information and, and start these conversations. So uh, yeah, just I, I thought that was a valuable thing I took from those face-to-face -face sessions last year. Thanks, Miles and Dave. 
Our next question comes from Ray, who is wondering about the FWIN sampling at Moose Lake in 2020. So um, he just says that the number of half nets compared to previous years decreased from 16 to 12. However, the lake surface area has increased. Uh, what effect would the reduced number of nets in a larger lake have in determining the CPUE? Hi. Um, yeah, I'd, I can take, uh, or I, I would like to uh, respond to that. So the question is, some, uh, there's two parts to the question. First part was the number of nets that were set. Second part of the question is the 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 lake level. So uh, to answer the first part of the question, um, the uh, uh, you, you'd asked why uh, we basically set 12 nets rather than 16 that we'd set the, in the previous survey. Um, easy answer is uh, I only needed 12 nets to get the answer that I needed. Um, uh, the catches were, were low uh, and, and consistently low. Um, I could get into, um, you know, data analysis and all that, but to really easily answer the question is, we set enough nets. Uh, the other part of the question is, um, would uh, we see, uh, um, would uh, water levels have, uh, or changing water levels have a um, uh, affect uh, the results of our surveys? I don't think so, um, at least not in any meaningful way. Um, uh, changes in volume are, I mean, uh, water levels change on, on lakes all, uh, all over the place. Um, it's just part of uh, the natural um, variability of the habitat. And we are sampling habitat. Uh, we don't adjust for volume. Um, we're sampling, uh, we're sampling um, the, the walleye fisheries, we're sampling the walleye habitat, um, and we don't, we don't correct for volume. Um, if we were to correct for volume, um, I, I am just speculating, and this is just, um, but I, I don't think it's going to make a, um, a, a, a big difference. It'd be, it, it, we, we have a term, uh, it's called decimal dust, when these small, uh, these small variations that impact um, uh, or influence a system um, are, are so, uh, so minute that um, they can only be um, described in, in, in uh, decimals. So thanks for the question. Dwayne, can, can I? Yeah, uh, I, oh. I, I liked your answer, Dwayne. Sorry, Miles. Um, mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the interesting thing about, um, like this is an interesting science question. We need precise answers when we uh, go out and collect our information. We want really defensible goods scientifically sound uh, answers. So a, a good analogy would be sighting your rifle in in the fall. So uh, if I go out and I am I shoot three bullets and it's two inches high and they're pretty well touching, it's like good, I've got a really good answer. But if I have one high and one to the left and one down below, then I need a few more bullets to, to make sure that I have a really good answer. So that's that's why you'll see some variability between um, our nets. And so um, we really do try to do is uh, set as few nets as uh, possible because I mean, it's, uh, it's staff time. It's uh, a use of the fish resource uh, that uh, like we, we're, so we, we wanna do as few as possible, but we wanna make sure that we have a good group so that we are, we're very confident that the rifle is shooting straight at the end of the season. It's Paul here, so maybe I'll add to that. So Stephen and Duane, we uh, monitor the uh, standard deviation or the variability around the estimate as we set nets, right? And then we stop typically once we've got a, as precise as we're targeting for, uh, you know, in terms of numbers. Is that not true? Yes. Yes, that is correct. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So some years, you know, if there's uh, more variability, we might set a few more nets to get the uh, precision that we're looking for and other years we might set less. So that's why it's not the same number of nets every year for a single water body. Yeah. And, and larger water bodies, they're more variable. So we tend to set more in larger water bodies and, and, and less uh, in smaller water bodies, but it's also depending on how many fish there are. So it, it's kind of complicated, but uh, yeah, I think we've, we've uh, covered that one nicely. Thank you. Great, thank you, Dwayne and Stephen and Paul. So we have two questions about Calling Lake here. One from Greg, just saying many anglers have voiced their concern over the pressure on Calling Lake. Do you worry about the residual effect on Calling Lake because of other high pressure fisheries? 
uh, for being closed for walleye, such as Rock Island um, or Wabasca. And then our other question that we have is from Jason, just saying calling lake hasn't been surveyed since 2017. Um, how do you choose which lakes are surveyed and when? And there's just been a really big increase in fishing pressure um, on this lake. And I'm concerned that we weren't, aren't monitoring it enough. So calling lake is managed out of my office, so I can touch on that. Um, thanks for those questions, Greg and Jason. Uh, the frequency that we, we survey these lakes is cyclical. Typically, uh, five years is a pretty normal cycle, but there's a lot of different reasons why a survey can occur more or less frequently. Could be a high pressure place, could be a, a, a SHL lake, a walleye tag lake, and we need a little bit more information to help with allocation. Uh, there could be a potential, a potential reg change, could be uh, we're combining it with a creel. There's a lot of different reasons, so it's we just have to be flexible with that. Uh, that said, I'm quite comfortable with calling lake being done every five years. Uh, the big thing is, is it needs to be assessed frequently enough so that I can measure population level changes. Um, kind of branching off to that other question, Alberta lakes have high pressure, we know that. COVID amplified that pressure. I think anybody who was out on calling lake this summer or even this winter, they see that, that increased pressure. Uh, it's no different than any other lake in the province. Uh, that said, the past two creels, they revealed that pressure is actually three to four times lower on Calling Lake than your average Alberta lake. And that's not even a high pressure lake. That might not seem intuitive. It might seem a little strange, but Calling Lake is a pretty big lake. It's 14,000 hectares. So that pressure gets spread out over a large geographic area. So that's the biggest factor, but there's, there's other factors too. It, it, it means it's more resilient to angling than the average Alberta lake. Uh, when you look at Rock Island Lake, the fact that Rock Island is closed, it has very little impact on Calling Lake. It's actually kind of the opposite. Calling Lake has the big impact on Rock Island. Uh, Rock Island, when it's open, acts as kind of a, Calling Lake acts as an overflow to Rock Island. When it's really windy, when it's really awful weather, people go to Rock Island Lake. When the weather's not right, when they want to go to a smaller lake, they go there. Rock Island Lake just can't take that pressure. So it's more of a problem that way. And then for other lakes in that, in that zone, as other lakes open up, it helps. But uh, I'll let Miles potentially talk about that as, as he manages lakes like, uh, like Wabasca. Miles, do you want to jump in? Uh, for sure. Thanks, Marcel. I, uh, yeah, so I, I think Marcel hit on a number of great points there. And um, it, when I look at the question, and I think about uh, certain statements, like things like uh, high effort lakes. So if, you know, if we looked at what um, fishing effort was on uh, the Wabasca lakes, we did a creel survey there uh, in um, 2000 and, uh, ooh, 13 or so, uh, and, and we're able to get an estimate. And, and at the time, we would actually evaluate it as, as sort of being uh, low moderate in terms of the hours and the number of anglers that were were there. Again, uh, you know, North Wabasca is a larger water body, uh, not calling lake size, but uh, you're starting to knock on the door. And so, as Marcel said, we, we do see natural variances in angling pressure and effort, and it moves around. And uh, at times, it's it's not um, as concerning what that, that number might be if it's the difference between two hours per hectare or four hours per hectare. Uh, you know, we see, we can see uh, impacts or uh, consequences of effort showing up when we kind of climb over certain thresholds. Uh, last week, there was a, a presentation that actually did an evaluation on slot limits. Uh, I would encourage everybody here to, to go and watch that video if you have the opportunity. Uh, one of the slides in the presentation uh, hits on something Marcel talked about, which is uh, a measurement of effort from this last year, understanding COVID uh, increased effort across the board. We saw more anglers on lakes that had slot limits and catch and release and a number of different things, uh, including uh, the lakes that had slot limits. And so we know effort can, can be bop around, it can move around. Uh, the regulations we try to impose on these water bodies um, have resiliency to some of those things. Uh, and so, yeah, you know, uh, a North Wab going to catch and release for a couple of years probably did displace some anguish to calling. Uh, as Marcel said, um, well, you know, if we've got a regulation on calling and a, an abundance that is uh, moderate to high abundance for walleye, there is a there is a range there where we can see an effort increase without a direct consequence to sustainability. But if we were to say, you know, double or triple that effort, that's where, you know, we might pick up a signal in our index nets that say, oh, we've, we've now seen a, uh, you know, a sizable decline. And that could then trigger 
uh, us to go, well, we need to determine why. Was this an increase in indigenous effort? Was this an increase in cumulative effort, angling? Uh, so we do have systems in place to check that. Um, and, and we do uh, appreciate that there is natural variance that, that does happen on the land base as well, so. Thanks, Miles, and Marcel as well. <laughs> so our next question comes from Ray. Has the competitive tournament fishing in 2020 been assessed to determine fish status compared with previous years? Uh, thanks, Ray, for that uh, question. So we do, uh, in the data returns that are required uh, when we uh, issue a permit to uh, conduct a competitive fishing event, we do uh, look at the data returns uh, from year to year, but you know, they're not terribly helpful in letting us manage the fishery as a whole. They do give us a sense of, you know, the, the amount of fish caught and therefore what might be the, uh, you know, the bycatch or the, uh, you know, the uh, mortality related to hook and release, you know, mortality. But it, but it, that's about as, you know, as far as that data uh, gives us, uh, you know, for information. It doesn't really give us, a, it's not a good indicator, like the catch rate in a tournament is not a very good indicator of, you know, walleye or, or pike abundance, because it's, you know, the people that are catching those fish are amongst the best fishermen that really know those water bodies. And they've often actually done some pre-fishing the days before to really know where to hone in on those fish. So, you know, by the nature, competitive fishing events are going to have high catch rates relative relative to the average angler or relative to the actual abundance of, the, of that species that they're uh, fishing for in that water body. And they're also doing it very, during a very short period of time where, you know, the you know, change in weather pressure might be a, you know, good fishing or it might be really poor fishing compared to the year before. So we really rely on our index net uh, netting program to give us a better picture of uh, the status of a fish population in individual lakes because we set those nets in the fall when you know walleye for example are, are known to be fish swimming around quite a bit and we also set those nets in randomly selected areas we don't set them in the same areas each year uh, we randomize those so that uh, you know we we take into consideration, uh, you know, variability, and we try to get the best estimate that we can on, say, fish abundance, for example, as well as the tournament, uh, you know, fish caught fish, uh, you know, we they're released, uh, whereas in the index name we can, you know, sample those fish and get an idea of growth rates, and we, we see all sizes of fish, not just the fish that are catchable on a hook, uh, and it gives us a much better idea of what the status of a fishery is. So we do look at the data, but it is of limited value in terms of managing a fishery. Thanks, Paul. Our next question comes from Jeff saying, instead of closing Moose Lake to walleye, wouldn't the usage of the high capacity cold lake fish hatchery over the past several years for walleye stocking prevent this issue? Hi, Janine, I'd like to answer. Um, that's a great question, Jeff, uh, and I'm glad that uh, I'm glad that you asked it. Um, so Moose Lake uh, walleye, um, the the reproduction in Moose Lake, uh, walleye reproduction, um, has been really poor. Um, and so, yes, uh, we could stock walleye in Moose Lake to make up for that poor recruitment. Um, and uh, that would be uh, kind of a Band-Aid solution. Um, I, um, I think that it's really important that we would look uh, for the, uh, the cause. Um, so that we could uh, correct that if possible. Um, it's all, uh, it's, um, well, I don't want to speak for Craig, uh, but Craig, uh, feel free to jump in, but there is a, a limit to the, the actual number of uh, eggs and, and uh, fish that can be um, supplied. So um, supplying the walleye for a, a moose lake, uh, for example, uh, might take up a, a, most of the production, the walleye production for for the facility for for that cycle. Uh, Craig, uh, if I if I'm getting that wrong, I mean, um, step in but also um, so they're they're, uh, they're <laughs> sorry, I, I had thought about this answer, but um, uh, we could use stocking uh, for uh, uh, for recovering the population, and um, it it wouldn't address the the root issue, uh, the recruitment issue, um, and so that uh, we would like to uh, solve that as well. Now, if there's a, a, a 
stalking is is a tool there are other tools um so the the first tool that we're going to try is uh or we would like to try is um going to catch and release to try and protect those spawning uh sized walleye uh because if we can get the the population to reproduce on its own um that would be preferable that would uh, free up um, resources in the hatchery uh, for maybe other uh, other applications um, or other stocking opportunities. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, uh, walleye stocking is certainly a tool um, and uh, we would like to look at uh, um, uh, some uh, um, potential um, egg sources. Um, so that we uh, we could maybe match up the 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 closest uh, neighbor um, population as a source rather than going to some other part of the province for for eggs. Like there there are uh, there are a lot of uh, questions and um, there are some um, some things that need, would would need to be worked out. But yeah, de uh, 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 walleye stocking or stock using stocking to enhance or recover um, or uh, uh, fisheries is, is 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 a tool in our in our toolkit. Thank you. Just uh, just real quickly from the hatchies perspective, the walleye room is uh, has a certain amount of uh, eggs that it can uh, incubate at a given time. So depending on where the other requests are, uh, if, if Moose Lake is on the list of lakes that the biologist wants us to stock, uh, and we have the eggs, it's just about allocation. You look at all the provincial list of all the lakes they want us to uh, hit. And if Moose Lake's on the list, we'll do our best to do that. Another new tool that we're gonna have for the, the, the biologist soon is uh, the ability to triploid our walleye egg so that it uh, can't reproduce. That's gonna be another option uh, that hopefully we can uh, try out this year. Great, thanks Duane and Craig. So our last question of the evening comes from Ian. If Pinehurst was successfully managed for years on tags, why not return it to tags? Uh, one year's test results may not be totally accurate as test nets every year. Over year can fluctuate. Catch rates quite different depending on where they were set in the lake. I'm not in favor of a catch and release limit on Pinehurst. Hi Ian, I'll take that question for you. Um, I touched on it a little bit in when I jumped in on somebody else's answer earlier. <laughs> um, so yes, Pinehurst uh, was managed with an SHL for recovery um, starting in 2006. So what we did was, like I had mentioned earlier, just uh, you know gave away less tags uh, than what um, the calculations that we do asked us to give out. So I gave out less tags hoping to see some recovery. We hadn't tried it yet um, or seen any successes with using tags for recovery. And of course, using what we, with the B tags, uh, basically a limited entry slot. So we were using a slot, just snuck it into an SHL. Uh, so we did see some recovery. Like I said, uh, in 2006, we started it. Uh, 2010 started to creep up a little bit. In 2014, um, we hit that um, FSI three line. So basically when the fish population goes from those zones that Duane was talking about earlier, from the or orange into the yellow, like in that yellow zones where we wanna live. That's what uh, Pinehurst is managed as, you know, FMO sustainable fishery. That's, my, that's what our target is. Uh, we just about hit the target. And uh, we started getting requests for folks wanting A tags. So in 2000, uh, starting in 2014, we started to give out those A tags along with the B tags. So we were giving out a little more tags than we were previously. And then we started to see a decline. Um, and 2018, we're starting to see some downward trend. I would like kind of made me concerned. I reduced the amount of tags. Uh, plus, we also had to account for those. Uh, the indigenous fishery, the, the indigenous angling fishery uh, that was going to be entering Pinehurst because Pinehurst um, had a death restriction uh, for their nets. So they uh, were predominantly catching whitefish in that lake previous. So now we have to accommodate the indigenous fishery starting 2008. Um, so we had to remove tags for that. Uh, I know folks who fish lake quite often uh, might remember that we may have had some condition factor issues with the walleye around that same time. Uh, so our larger walleye were looking a little bit on the skinny side. The smaller walleye around 
50 centimeters and down, uh, we're in good shape still. It's those big old walleye that weren't looking so good. Uh, so in 2018, like I said, it reduced the amount of tags again, and then we tried the SHL, I'm sorry, the slot in 2020. Uh, so that I imagine folks are probably wondering, oh my God, skinny fish. Um, so we, those skinny fish are likely mostly attributed to the fact that those fish were like 10 to 25 years old. They were old, um, so they were likely going to leave the fishery anyways, and there may have been some issues with um, maybe some uh, perch coming up, so sufficient feed for that size of fish. Uh, so can we use a SHL again? So the levels of uh, adults we have right now in 2020 are currently lower than what they were when we started the SHL in 2006. Um, and like I had mentioned earlier, um, you know, it. I believe it's a little bit too low now to put it on an SHL and expect a recovery. Like the last recovery took, you know, 10 years almost. Um, I think that folks would want to have that sooner. So by putting on this catch and release um, now, and uh, we get a nice little jump start. Hopefully, you know, those walleye, because we have a nice walleye right around just under that 50, those perfect spawning females ready to go. Um, if we can get them to spawn and reproduce and we get some recruitment, we might be able to turn us around quite quickly. If we do that SHL and give away tags, uh, it'll be a slow recovery. And to be honest, it would be like such a small amount of tags that it may not even be worth the effort of doing so. So we're talking in, in the range of, you know, maybe 500. So I, I don't think um, doing that would be as, as good or you know, occur as quickly for recovery if we just catch and release three years, a little bit of pain for some long-term gain. Thanks. Great, thanks, Alicia. All right, folks, so that brings us to the end of our evening. So thank you everybody so much for joining us again. As I mentioned earlier, we're so excited to see people engaged and willing to come and chat with us and spend their evenings with us. Um, we do have our survey that is open on the proposed regulation changes until February 8th at 9 a.m. So please fill that out if you haven't filled it out already. We also have a bunch of other resources available on that same web page as well. So if you just Google sport fishing regulations 2021-22, uh, it should be the first page that comes up. And there you can find fact sheets on all of the proposed changes, um, providing a bit of background information, an interactive water body map, and again, that ASCII experts. So if we didn't get to your question tonight, um, or you have some follow-up questions, that's a great place that you can go to submit your questions. So this is the last webinar um, in our series that we have, but there's still other opportunities to get engaged with us. So if you don't follow us on Facebook or like us on Facebook, please go and have a look at our My Wild Alberta page. That is where we do a lot of our communicating about some of the work that our staff are up to throughout the year and also where we will be communicating future engagements through as well. And then last but, last, need, last but not least, we have our family fishing weekend coming up in February where you can fish without a sport fishing license, but regulations still apply. So uh, look forward to some really exciting educational material that'll be coming out for that, particularly on our Facebook page. So with that folks, I'd like to thank you again for joining us. You will have a webinar survey that will pop up on your screen when we end the meeting this evening. And we'd love for you to fill it out and provide us with feedback on your experience for tonight or through any of the other webinars that you attended. And thanks again for spending your time with us. We look forward to connecting with you all again in the future sometime soon. Have a great night. <laughs>